Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On today's Inning Explain, we're looking at the Italian Metaflick, a classic horror story. We follow a group of five people traveling by camper who are then thrown into a world of terror after they crash into a tree. Once they recover, they find out that the road they were driving on has been replaced by an impenetrable forest along with a creepy wooden house. That's not good. You know, it's kind of funny when I was putting this on, I was like, oh, an Italian horror movie. You really don't see too much of that nowadays. A far cry from the heights of Jello back in the 70s and 80s. Turns out that the filmmakers apparently have this same idea on their mind as well. And in a sense, it really feels like trying to recapture and bring back Italian horror to life. As the title suggests, it really leans into several obvious homages and cliches from classic horror movies that came before it. Where it perhaps falters is that while it is amusing pointing out its many references, in particular it owes a lot to various folk horror flicks, the problem is it doesn't really elevate its itself beyond the tropes. There is a potential reason for this baked into the story, but it still does feel perhaps a bit cheap in that sense. It also diverts into an overly meta direction, particularly in the end. It kind of changes the overall feeling of the movie and what it initially seemed to be going for, evolving more into a statement on modern society. It is intriguing, but it does maybe feel a bit out of left field to me. Regardless, there is a lot I enjoyed about this one, and it also does get quite confusing as more details are revealed that even has ties weirdly to the origins of the mafia. And I was like, okay, along with leaving our final survivor with a very open ending. So let's check out a classic horror story, breaking down the story, including the history of the cult and what they're all about, how I interpret our survivor's outcome, along with explaining the meaning behind the very meta ending. We're immediately presented with a grisly situation that sets up the danger at hand in the seemingly idyllic countryside. A girl is chained to a table looking pretty beat up. Footsteps are heard approaching along with a loud scraping noise. Someone in a robe is wielding a massive mallet and comes to her, bringing it down, crunching her skull to bits. Yikes. We then meet our random group of strangers that have the bad luck of winding up in the death cabin themselves, led by Elisa. We don't really learn too much about any of our characters, but we at least understand that she is pregnant and her overbearing mom has forced her to get an abortion, telling her that she cannot afford to have a baby. To butter her up, she offers to buy her a new wardrobe, to which Elisa weakly agrees, telling her, well, I'll see you tonight. A notification comes in that it's time to join her new buddies. A rusty RV pulls up honking, and she leaves her full sandwich behind, showing us she's obviously a little troubled about her situation. The sweaty driver, Fabrizio, does taped introductions for each of the passengers, telling them to say hi to the viewers so that they will grow to like them more. But they are mostly muted in their responses. They're on their way to his hometown of Calibria, we learn, and I'm like, is this normal in Italy? Just get in an old RV with a bunch of random ass strangers? I guess so. So, passing the time with a trivia game, on one question regarding Pennywise, Fab proves that he knows his stuff, correcting that he doesn't technically feed on children, but their fear. Hmm, smart kid. He then offers everyone some brewskis, which Mark in particular is stoked about, beaming that he just earned himself a five-star rating. In the paper, there's a story about a mother and daughter having gone missing, and we find out that the mafia is in the area. There's more than one around, it turns out. The lady mayor of the town is quoted as specifically being anti-mafia, and the others rib her on her appearance, asking if she resembles a lasagna. Lisa starts gagging, and they're forced to pull over for her to ratchet on the side of the road. Ricardo takes the opportunity to leave a voicemail to what sounds like his estranged wife, asking her to try and work things out, and to be reasonable. For some reason, Mark wants to take over driving even though he's been drinking. The others give him guff about it, and he invites Ricardo to take the seat, but he strangely doesn't have his driver's license. With no further argument, he takes the helm. Fab and Mark bond over some bullying encounters they had when they were children, and chuckle about how teenagers think violence is cool or something. Just like in a bad movie! Appropriate. They toast to good movies, and seeing a dead animal in the road, Fab grabs the wheel, sending them careening right into a tree. Elisa comes to later hearing muffled shouting, and Mark got injured in the crash, seeing that his leg is severely broken. They get it set with help from Dr. Ricardo, and then attempt to call emergency services. Yet 
no one has any phone signal, which is odd. You should always be able to get through to 118, the equivalent of 911, obviously. Ricardo decides to go up the road to look for help. Yet after looking out the window, there's strange news. There is no road. Somehow their car was moved to a completely different location than where they crashed. They spot an ominous looking cabin nearby and then pass by a setup with speakers along with a floodlight. Sophia knocks on the door and it appears that nobody's home. They play the blame game about the crash going between Mark and Fab, but Ricardo scoffs the bigger problem here is they somehow wound up deep in the woods. Not like they fell out of the sky, you know? He decides to try and find the road and to his chagrin, Fab forces himself to tag along, knowing that they have to head south. In the interim, Sophia and Elisa get to know each other a little better. Sophia has her own jewelry line, showing off a tacky heart ring that she made. She asks if she thinks the wreck was indeed Mark's fault, and Elisa doesn't think so, promising her that he'll be fine. Fab keeps incessantly babbling about a horror movie he recalls, where the people found themselves trapped in a kind of limbo. But Ricardo hushes him in annoyance, telling him to focus on the road. They then stumble across an obviously ritualistic display of three stick figures wearing red sashes, also adorned with several animal heads. The sign reads, The Three Knights of Honor, Ricardo wondering if it's something satanic. Fab tells him, yeah, more or less. How does he know? He warns that they need to leave now, especially after noticing all the animal heads are fresh. At the RV, Elisa notices the cabin door is now open and decides to investigate. There's still no sign of anyone inside, and she pauses at the deer head, now knowing for certain this is the same location from the beginning, which certainly does not bode well for them. She takes in a wall full of old-looking pictures, featuring people wearing various masks. A noise from the back sends her to another room, with candles all over the ground. The others join her at the display, and Fab clues them in to what this is all about. It involves a legend of Osso, Mostroso, and Caragnoso. That was my excellent Italian accent. Three brothers from another world a long time ago. People then were dying of starvation, and the brothers promised to save them on the condition of them providing a sacrifice in return. The villagers choose a victim and then prepare the ritual. They cut out their tongue, then ears, and finally their eyes. With their blood spilled, the village is rid of hunger. Over time, the people became the brothers' flock, essentially becoming worshippers of them. This too is also strangely tied to the actual origins of the mafia. Those brothers were indeed part of its founding. There is an urban legend involving that as well. Pretty sure it didn't involve any ritualistic sacrifices though. Maybe. I don't know. Alarmingly, it's starting to look like the group is their latest targets. As Elisa verifies, there were five animal heads back in the forest. And yep, there's five of them. That night, everyone listlessly waits around for morning to come. Mark is feeling down on himself, asking Sophia why she's with a loser like him. And oddly out of nowhere, Fab starts chuckling to himself. He relays the absurdity he finds in their situation. They crashed into a tree and woke up at the house of Sam Raimi. Animal heads, pictures of crazy farmers, phones not working. As he points out, it's a perfect setup for a classic horror movie. I'll say. He leaves to take a whiz and sees two people wearing masks holding hands watching them from the trees. A distant scream wakes the others, everyone crowding to the window looking at the cabin. There's another scream heard and the girls go to check it out. They ascend into an attic, Sophia bravely taking the lead. Fab runs back with news of the people in the woods. They gotta get out of here. They come to another odd sight, a girl trapped inside of a tree branch cocoon kind of thing. She doesn't say a word and we see why this is, her tongue nearby in a jar. Looking out the window, a red light washes over everything, followed by an air horn siren blaring. At the RV, several robed figures are there. Sophia wants to help Mark, but Ricardo holds her back, covering her mouth to keep her quiet. They haul him inside and they strap him down to the table. First, they set the scene with some tunes via a cassette tape and then get to work. Taking the mallet, they smash the absolute hell out of both of his feet. Seeing one of the fingers has a big old tongue hanging out. They place a spiky device right over his face and start cranking it down, getting closer and closer, stopping just above the eyes. They then keep cranking, Mark heard screaming intensely as it breaks through the skin, hearing fleshy, squelching sounds. Poor Sophia having to watch helplessly through the floor slats. The sirens start back up and they take his body outside. The red light switches off and things appear back to normal. Sophia is beside herself, staring off into space with tears rolling down her cheeks. Ricardo decides to help the girl after all, pulling the branches away to set her free. She immediately rushes into Elisa's arms, 
Quick bonding there, huh? They retrieve their stuff from the RV and set off into the woods. They then come to a graveyard of cars, showing us they definitely aren't the first people the cult have gotten a hold of. Ricardo and Sophia get into an argument, with her blaming him for Mark's death as he wouldn't let her go help. He counters that, well, you didn't really even try that hard. You could have bitten his hand or kicked him in the nuts or something if she was so inclined, but, well, she didn't. Besides, what could they have done anyway? Elisa breaks them up, calling it all just a horrible accident. They ask what kind of doctor he is anyway, as most don't use carpooling very often, but he keeps mum on the matter. We see the girl has a diary, learning that her name is Kiera. Elisa asks if she knows how to get out of the forest, and she writes back cryptically in response, it's not a forest. The sirens start up again, and the gang quickly get a move on. Unbelievably, they wind up right back at the cabin where they started. And now the camper is gone too. What the heck is going on here, man? Fab appears confused as well, certain that they were going south. Ricardo angrily grabs him, and he makes maintains that he wants to save himself just as much as they do. They find one leftover beer for them waiting on the ground, and hey, at least they left one behind. Determining what to do next, they recall that the people came back after dark, and even though they don't want to go back inside the cabin, they decide it's better in there than out here. Sophia announces that if they do come back, we'll burn it all to the ground. Night falls, and they all split the beer, that is except for Fab, who gives the excuse of having to be on watch. Sure, great excuse. Ricardo finally opens up about his situation, he made a mistake during an operation that led to a patient's death, and as a result lost everything. Even worse, in the aftermath, he lashed out at his wife, and now she won't even let them see their daughter anymore. But ultimately, he feels that she is in the right. Fab tells a strange joke about meeting a guy from the north while camping. He kept accusing him, as he is from the south, of being in the mafia. He tried to reason with him repeatedly, but he refused to ever give in. The guy came back the next day spouting the same thing all over, so he says he had him killed. The joke being that he was in the mafia after all. Hilarious. Kira starts laughing first, followed by the others awkwardly joining in, then busting into full guffaws. Now it's Elisa's turn to open up and find out as potentially suspected that her parents are kind of overbearing and a pain in the ass. When she told them that she wanted to quit school and do something else, in response, her mom took them to a seaside resort where they stayed in a gorgeous mansion. She told her this would have been theirs if not for having to pay for her school cost. Two days later, out of guilt, she was back in school. So yeah, that's a pretty shitty thing to do, obviously. They already all figured out she was already pregnant. Elisa lamenting that the baby was doomed before even coming here, feeling getting rid of it is her only option. Sophia gifts her with the heart ring, apparently the first one she ever made, saying that when she finished it, she felt that she knew that she could succeed on her own. The two bond, holding hands amongst all the madness. Inevitably, later, the red light washes back over the area, along with the sirens coming back, which wakes Elisa up. She steps outside, and the lights suddenly shut off, where she's greeted by quite a scene. There's a whole mob of mask-wearing folks out there waiting for her, along with three red-robed figures prominently up front. Obviously, we're seeing that that legend Fab described earlier is, in fact, reality, and the three represent those noble knights from long ago. And, well, it's time for another sacrifice in their name. We see that Sophia is tied up, and Fab appears, grabbing Elisa back inside, quickly barricading the door. The tongue guy, presumably the leader, holds up the jarred tongue to the the crowd, who respond by all clicking their own tongues rapidly. Another one warms up a knife in the fire, and comes to Sophia and jams it all up in there real good. As we also recall, they take your tongue, eyes, and ears. The same fate befalls Ricardo, getting their bits brutally chopped off piece by piece. They put them each into a little display thing, making a face from their parts. Neat! Arts and crafts! They lift the head to its final resting place, adorning the top of the person-shaped wicker thing. Yeah! Definitely getting some wicker man vibes here, I don't think they would argue with that. Finally, Sophia and Ricardo's throats are slit, falling forward lifelessly as they bleed out. Elisa sobs at the horrifying sight, and Fab weirdly tries to comfort her, asking to give her a hug. And I mean, it already seemed like this guy was in on it, right? Especially at this point. He told them the whole story of the knights, he's from this area, it's like, duh, of course he was part of the whole thing from the beginning. Elisa puts the pieces together for herself when seeing the empty beer bottle on the floor, realizing that it must have been drugged. That's why they slept through the whole thing. We also remember he did not take a drink. He keeps trying to maintain his innocence, but his cover is ultimately blown for good when she overhears someone calling him over an earpiece. She snatches it away, causing Fab to have a straight-up hissy fit. He starts calling her a bitch, amongst many other things, accusing her of ruining everything. He looks to the deer head and orders them to take her. Figures immediately bust in, easily pushing the table out of the way. She's quickly overpowered and is dragged out screaming for help. In a quite drastic contrast to just before, things suddenly 
suddenly appear quite jovial and celebratory. People are picking onions and putting some pasta together. Looks like their latest ritual went off without a hitch and nature's bounty is plentiful once more. Nice. Everyone is gathered around a massive table and Elisa is there too, seeing she's been stigmatized with nails through her hands binding her to the chair. The mayor lady is there from the article in the RV, the whole lasagna thing. We also remember she was being quoted as being anti-mafia, yet here we are, she's apparently running the whole show it seems. A young boy sings a song all about their favorite nights, seeing that half of his face is deformed for some reason. No, they don't really t say anything about that. She toasts to the nights and proclaims to everyone, enjoy your meal. Elisa looks miserable and starts bawling. Everyone at the table imitates her whimpering in a mocking way. The mayor orders them to stop and comes up to her, explaining her situation as she sees it. Everyone is content because she looks after them, so even though they are making fun of her, to them she is actually the most important of them all. She's got to die for them. I mean, what else are you going to do, you know? She also expresses the necessity to learn to adapt, as the mafia is no longer what it used to be. So they're rebranding, it appears. Instead of Tommy guns and fedoras, it's sacrificing people and playing dress up. Sounds fun. There's a brief moment of hope when the police arrive, but the mayor saunters right over with no issue, and they just drive off. So, yeah, probably got them in her pocket too. Sorry, Elisa. She's wheeled into another room, looking weak and broken, and learns the real reason all this has been happening. In front of her is a wall of monitors, with cameras set up all around the camp. The signal cuts away, and Fab flickers on screen, smirking to give us a smile. He again is annoyed with her for messing up his master plan, but ultimately found her uncovering him to be a real turn on. Ugh, pretty gross. She asks about Kiera, and he coyly responds, telling her no spoilers. She's pissed, realizing his game, recording videos of people being tortured and killed. He corrects that they're actually horror movies, which sends Elisa into absolute hysterics. Even he's kind of like, whew, wow, geez, what the fuck, lady? So I end up dying in some loser's fake movie, she cries, and names the knights as a so-called villain. He reveals the mafia's next act of rebranding. He's turned their founding fathers into the new Freddy, Leatherface, and and Jason. He's so confident in his movie, he boasts that if he was in the States, he'd already be signed on for a sequel. She spits back that his movie sucked. It's just a carbon copy of other films. Yep, kind of got him dead to rights there. And Fab turns his ire to the landscape of modern Italian cinema, where horror has fallen completely out of fashion. He complains no one wants to be scared, but you turn on the TV, and in real life, there's nothing but death. He thinks they actually enjoy the real thing more than fiction, and that that is the future, the most requested kind of content. Real killing, real horror. Not mine, she counters, and Fab cuts the signal. Without hesitation, Elisa painfully removes her hands from the nails and teeters out of the small building. She comes to the camper, now filled with bodies, even including the goat that they swerved to miss on the road. This thing really was a whole setup from the get-go. This is made even more clear when she comes to a bunch of tents, and it really does resemble a movie set with various costumes around, including the girl's dress hung out on a line. She enters another tent, finding the leader's three twisted masks on the wall, along with many others filling the entire room. She hears a door open nearby. It's Fab, already back on a tirade about Elisa ruining his movie. He tries to figure out how to fix things with a reshoot and see that he's talking to Kiera, who was also obviously in on it the whole time, his sister from the looks of it. She thinks his change won't work. You can't knock her out again. The client, along with mom, demanded Elisa is to be awake when killed. Showing what a little bitch he really is, he moans to fuck mom and only gets angrier. She smacks him good, which does at least shut him up, groaning about his incompetence. Kiera sticks her cut tongue appliance back in and dons her dress, complaining that she wants to be the villain next time. A voice crackles in on the radio that it's time to shoot scene 15, but both admit that they don't know what is supposed to happen next. It appears Elisa has figured out their ending for them. Kira flings open the door, and she's there waiting for her with a shotgun and new costume. The girl can only utter crap before she gets blown away with a shot to the stomach. Fab rushes out, and after emptying the shell, she gets him in the leg. She has her own camera that she turns to face him. He screams to the others, weakly trying to crawl away. He attempts to point out the futility of killing him. So what? All the others will still get her in the end and feed her to the pigs. He asks her to put down the rifle so that they can find a solution. He fake sobs to her that he's so scared, but she's not buying it anymore and shushes him with a barrel in the mouth. She turns the tables on him, telling him, don't worry, it's only a movie. He foolishly starts back on his bitch talk and she fires. The shot exploding out of the back of his skull. Well, so much for that, fabby boy. She walks right up to the camera and removes her mask, grumbling, there's your ending, and shuts off the tape. She then ventures into the woods, hearing the group's sirens starting to wail in the distance. Hearing someone there with her, she spins around with the gun at the ready, but it's just some kid wearing flo 
floaties. He panics and flees, leading her to a hole in a nearby fence. There's a sign reading military area, no trespassing under surveillance. So it seems like they took over an old military compound apparently. She steps out onto a beach full of people hanging around and to them she is quite the sight. Some girls even recording her on their phones. She pulls out her own phone and thanks to finally having signal is greeted by a countless new text from her mom wondering where she is. She drops the phone to the ground and walks purposefully towards the water. Now everyone is taping her on their phones with a certain indifference. No one, you know, asking if she needs help or anything. Now fully submerged, the blood starts to stream off of her, being cleansed in a way, and clutches at her stomach, it looks like. That is the abrupt conclusion to Elisa's story, but not for the movie itself, as things go into a very meta twist. The title blasts on screen, and we see a chat window of people discussing their feelings on the movie that they just watched. Some express disappointment that Elisa didn't die, while another chimes in that the legend is real. Look it up! Another guy types out, okay, I'll watch it now, and logs not into Netflix, but Blood Flicks. Dang, maybe I should have gone with that instead of Found Flicks. Sounds pretty cool. Oh well. Amongst a sea of other similar looking violent content, he clicks on a thumbnail for a classic horror story. The rest of the mafia must have finished it in spite of Fab's death. It opens with that introductory video of them on the RV when we met the whole crew. Already disinterested, the viewer skips all the way ahead to the end, where Elisa takes out Fab. After seconds of viewing, his attention is distracted by his daughter popping in with news that dinner is ready. He tells her he's on his way and dismissively awards the movie a thumbs down despite the fact that he pretty much skipped the whole entire thing. Before we circle back to Elisa and her ending, let's look at what they obviously are going for with this ending here. It definitely feels like this whole direction at the end is to make a statement about society on a few different levels. As we saw with the beachgoers behavior, everyone just staring at her and taping her on their phones rather than actually helping her out in any way. It shows just how obsessed with technology today we are. Everyone buried in their phones. But this also kind of keeps them at a distance from reality, seeing everything through the layer of their phones, which disconnects themselves in a way from what's going on right in front of them. The same goes for the Bloodflix viewer, which critiques how we as a society consume violent content. Again, he's completely disaffected by the movie, despite it containing real life murders. Should be, you know, very disturbing. Similar to what Fab was rambling about, people are so desensitized to fake violence that only the real thing will work nowadays. And even that, as we see already, doesn't have much of an impact on the viewer whatsoever. That seems to be the idea they're going for here. We've all become completely desensitized and disconnected to an unfortunate degree, thanks to our phones. Now, when it comes to Lisa and where things up with her, it's definitely abrupt and inconclusive, but I do think there are a few hints at where she is at now, thanks to surviving her harrowing trip. Her whole thing was about how she was being treated by her overbearing parents, and she seems just kind of put up with it. In particular, when it comes to her baby, this is important. I think the intention of Kiera is to show her that despite her initially feeling she isn't cut out to be a mom, we see based on how she acts with her in a kind of surrogate mother way that proves she is maternal after all. She does really instantly bond with and care about the girl. Too bad she turned out to be a lying little asshole. Regardless, because of this, it leads me to think, along with her clutching her belly in the water, that she is after everything going to actually keep her kid in defiance of her parents. Now finally standing up for herself. It also seems important too that when getting signal back, there's all those messages from her mom, but she chooses to ignore them completely. It doesn't try to call or anything. Also solidifying that she is strong strong enough to go forward on her own. Also, it's amusing as Fab's original incarnation of the story had Elisa dying, but he was usurped by the biggest trope of them all, the final girl. Well, that about wraps it up for this look at a classic horror story. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of a classic horror story and its ending? What do you think Elisa does next? What's your favorite Italian horror flick? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time. Ciao, Bella!